of God's, all God's people say, amen. You may be seated. The United States of America has three branches of government. We have the executive branch, which is headed by a president. We have the legislative branch, which is our Congress, our House of Representatives, and United States Senators. And we have the judicial branch, which is our Supreme Court. In the early days of the establishment of our government, a republic, a, one, a, republic, a, 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 a republic nation, they thought, our founding forefathers thought, in order to have the type of balances we need, checks and balances, we'd have three, three branches of government. And so they came here, they wanted to get away from an imperial government, a government ruled by one man, a dictatorship, a sovereignty of someone, well, some, if you would. And so the United States really has never, per se, never known a king or never known an imperial type government. But did you know that we had in our history, and this is true, you can look it up yourself, did you know that there was a man that at one time in the mid-1800s who got up and proclaimed himself as emperor and king of the United States? His name was Joshua Norton. Joshua Norton came to California during the gold rush days, seeking to find his fortune up in the foothills of California, as many did, searching for gold. Joshua Norton speculated everything he had trying to make, make it just really big. Unfortunately, in speculation, he lost everything. He lost everything, including his mind, literally. Joshua Norton became a mentally ill, delusional man. He made his way from the foothills of California, coming all the way back down here to San Francisco, and one day he got up and just proclaimed to people in the streets of San Francisco, I want you to know I am Joshua Norton. You are, to, uh, you are to bow down to me as your emperor and your king. Now to do that, he donned a cape. He put on a, all the royal regalia. He put a sword at his side. I mean, he did all these things to represent that he was a king. And believe it or not, you would think people would kind of laugh at this and be mocking at him, but people actually indulged this man. They actually accepted his behavior. He'd go by the local police departments, and they would say, Hello, Mr. Emperor, Sir Emperor, Mr. King, Emperor Norton, King Norton. He even got to place, he was even able to help get people to, uh, to pay a small tax to him by which how he subsidized his activities and things. And it just went around during the remainder years of his life being acknowledged by different groups of people. People, restaurants acknowledge him. People in streets acknowledge him. He could call a gathering of people. It was an amazing thing. This man was acknowledged his name as, as Emperor Norton. Joshua Norton eventually passed away. At his funeral, they had probably close to 10,000 or more people attend his funeral, one of the largest attended funerals at that time in the state of California. And certainly he went down, he was buried in his grave, he was remembered, and he's in the history books as a man known as Emperor Norton. This man died confused and wrong, delusional, incompetent, because he thought it was emperor. I want to tell you this morning, even though there are people that bowed to that man and revered him as an emperor, I want to tell you this morning, we have a king who never dies. We have a king who is alive. We, as a king, we have a king this morning who we must bow down to and we must worship, and his name is Jesus Christ. We're looking at Malachi chapter 1, the last of the Old Testament prophets. After this, after this Malachi, the book of Malachi, 400 years of absence as far as a message from God. Now there's a lot that happens in Jewish history during that time. We read about things like Antiochus Epiphanes and bringing the, this, the abominable things to the altar and Judas Maccabeus being raised up, being great zealot, zealous patriot who uh, fought against him and overthrew that. I mean, a lot of, a lot of, there are a lot of heroic things that the Jews did, but no message from God until we get to the book of Matthew. Malachi was the last messenger. Malachi was a contemporary of Nehemiah. Very similar men. They may have known each other. Very similar in their tone, very similar in their message, very similar in their burdens and their concerns. Malachi was a prophet of God. He was a man who loved the Lord. He starts off in Malachi verse, chapter 1, verse 1, the burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. It wasn't that the message he had was a burden to him. It was just the fact that there was heaviness in this message. 
a sobriety to the message, a soberness to the message, a message that called, when you read that, the burden of the word of the Lord was calling upon God's people to give heed and attention to the seriousness of the message and the matter. And Malachi, as we read through the book of Malachi, four short chapters, you could probably read in about 15, 20 minutes. Emphasis is made throughout the book about the names of God. And of course, if we just want a good study, we want to bless our heart and encourage our lives, it would do us well to study the names of God. In verse 6, God represents himself as father and master. And we see one phrase that's used repeatedly in the book of Malachi. It's the phrase, the Lord of hosts, or we would say in Hebrew, Jehovah Sabaoth. The Lord of the great armies. The Lord of the great and unconquerable army. And it's used 24 times in this book because God had a very heavy burden in his heart for his people known as the Jews and the people there at Jerusalem. But the name I call your attention to this morning comes from verse 14. God said, I am a great king, saith the Lord of hosts. In our world right now, there are 44 known monarchies as of May 27th, 2021. 44 known monarchies. 13 are in Asia. 12 are in Europe. 10 are in North America. 6 are in Oceania. 3 are in Africa. But there's only one monarch we must bow to and recognize. He's the great king. He is the only one who can claim himself as king. The Bible says in Psalm 47, verse 2, For the Lord Most High is terrible. He is a great king over all the earth. Psalms 95, 3, For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. I want us to take a moment with the brief time we have left today to notice some things from this passage of Scripture about our great king. This great king who says, I am a great king, saith the Lord. Number one, would you notice this this morning? Would you notice the royal identity of this great king? The royal identity of this great king. Notice the Bible tells us some things about this king, the Lord of hosts. We know from our Bible that God, our king, is infinitely eternal. He's infinitely eternal. He has no beginning. He has no ending. He's from everlasting to everlasting. He's an eternal king. Every king who's lived on this planet has eventually died and has been buried. But we have a king who's everlasting from everlasting. He is a king who lives and reigns forever. Exodus 15, 18 says, the Lord shall reign forever and ever. And I can say amen to that. 1 Timothy 1:17. Paul, as he's writing first to, to Timothy, his uh, protege in the faith, and mentoring him and encouraging him and reminding him in those verses, I think from verse 8 or verse 9 or so down to verse 17 or so, about, about uh, Paul's salvation and Paul's calling to the ministry. But he didn't want to have emphasis in Paul and, and Timothy lingering his thoughts about uh, what God was doing in Paul's life. He wanted to draw P Timothy's attention back to the God he served and Timothy served. And he said, now unto the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Brother and sister in Christ, friend here today, I want to tell you and attest this morning that we have a God who's infinitely eternal. He's from everlasting to everlasting. He is truly immortal. He is truly the life. He is truly the way. He's almighty and omnipotent. There's nothing he cannot do. Psalms 24, 8 tells us, who is this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. He's Jehovah Salva, the Lord of hosts. He is God who has who is an everlasting king. He is God who has an everlasting kingdom. Daniel attests to that in Daniel 7, 14, when he wrote, there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom which shall, which shall never be destroyed. Thank God this morning we have a king who is infinitely eternal. But knowing he's infinitely eternal, we know that this king, this God we serve, this king who wrote this Bible, this 
king who sent his son to die for our sins, this king who's everlasting, he's also a king who must be importantly exalted. Now, a king is to be exalted. He's to be worshipped. He's to be respected. He's to be revered. And I want to test you this morning. Our king is worthy and deserving of your worship and my worship. Did you this morning as you got up, as you rolled out of bed, did you take a moment to thank him that he's king? Did you worship him that he's king? Did you honor his name? Did you exalt him by any means? By means by maybe perhaps in driving to church this morning, did you take a moment to say, I'm thankful that you're my king, that you're the king of kings and the Lord of lords? Did you recognize him as being importantly exalted? The wise men there in Persia, they followed the star from the east and they followed the star. They found their way there to Bethlehem at the little place where Mary and Joseph and Jesus were living. And there as they saw the, child, the, tri, the Christ child, they bowed before him and worshiped him as the king of the Jews. They acknowledged in their heart that he was king of the Jews. And they bowed and brought their gifts before him. Do we bow before our king this morning? Do we bow before our king this coming week? Did we bow before our king this past week? Psalms 47, 7 says, For God is the king of all the earth. Sing ye praises with understanding. We tried carefully to select some hymns this morning that will exalt our Lord as king, crown him with many crowns. Oh, worship the king. I remind you this morning, he's to be importantly exalted. He's king over all the earth. Isaiah 6, 5 records for us, the experience that Isaiah had in the year the king Uzziah died. For many, many years, Isaiah had his eyes focused on an earthly king. And he was a great king and good king until the latter year of his life when he tried to uh, depose the priest and assume the office of the priest. And then because of his sin, God made him a leper. And there that, that king Uzziah spent the remainder of his years in a leper's house and died a horrible, miserable death. But I remind you, Isaiah's eyes were on king Uzziah in the year that he died. God lifted his eyes and got his eyes on someone bigger, someone better. And he saw a glimpse, if you would. He saw the sight of the holiness of the Lord. My friend, I want to tell you this morning, if you've never seen the holiness of God, if you've never spent time in the holy presence of God, that is something you must do. That is something you must get yourself to because you'll never really understand God. You'll never really understand the attributes of God until you understand the holiness of God. Thank God for all the attributes of God, that he's love and that he's light and that he's merciful and that he's gracious and he's kind and he's everlasting and all that. But we won't understand that until we understand the holiness of of God, because all the attributes of God are an emanation of that holiness. It's reflected in the fact that we worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness, and the beauty of the Lord is found in his holiness. Isaiah saw that, and Isaiah, even though he had a walk with God, and even though Isaiah was a great man of God, he recognized how sinful, how defiled, how wretched, how insignificant he was. And he said this in Isaiah 6, 5, Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Oh, may God help us this morning to see the holiness of God from his scriptures and the holiness of God through worship and to recognize as Isaiah, we are undone and we can say, woe is me that I'm a man of unclean lips and of unclean life. He is to be importantly exalted. But notice our God is King. The, as we look at his royal identity, notice this. He is to be importantly exalted. He is infinitely eternal, but he's individually exclusive. There's only one king. I said there's only one king. He's individually exclusive. Psalms 24:10. Who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory, Selah. 1 Timothy 6:15. Paul, as he's writing to Timothy, elaborates further from where he left off in 1 Timothy 1.17. He said, in which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. During the early days of our country, the colonists came here to escape from England from being under the tyranny of imperial rule. King George III was king at that time. But there were a few colonists, that's all they knew. All they knew was living under monarchy. And they thought, you know what? George Washington has established himself as a great leader. Of course, he became our first president. He established himself as a great commander, general, leader. And there were a few colonists that said, you know, General Washington, why don't we make you king over the United States? General Washington, as many, the majority of the colonists said, no. We didn't come here to establish a monarchy. We came here to recognize that we're going to establish a nation under God. 
And we came here to establish that there would be only one king we would acknowledge, and that king would be Jesus Christ. In April 22nd, 1774, right before the Revolutionary War, a report was sent to King George III by the governor of Boston proclaiming, if you ask any American who is the name of the king, he will tell you he has no king but one, and that is Jesus Christ. In April 1775, a British major who just despised the colonists called them villains and evil, and he told them, you better lay down your arms in the name of King George, the sovereign king of England. The immediate unanimous response of all of the colonists was this, we recognize no sovereign but God and no king but Jesus. I want to park on that for just a moment. Just like those colonists, if you really love God, if you're really serving the Lord. If you're really saved, you recognize no king but Jesus Christ. There is no king but Jesus Christ. There is no king but Jesus Christ in the local New Testament church. There is no king but Jesus Christ when it comes to the preaching of God's word. There is no king but Jesus Christ as we approach the throne of grace to seek mercy and find grace to help in time of need. There is no king but Jesus Christ for the throne of every heart, for the throne of every home. There is no king but Jesus Christ today. It's individually exclusive. We see his royal identity. Notice, secondly, this morning, something else. We go to verse 6 to 14. And God told Malachi he had some issues to address with his people. God is king, but his people did not acknowledge him as king. In verses 6 to 14, we see a righteous indictment. God has to call out some things. Sometimes God has to call out some things on us. Sometimes God has to be righteously blunt and righteously direct and righteously truthful in helping us to know, thus saith the Lord. As we unfold this, we look at verse 6, and the first thing God addresses is their attitude towards his name and his person. And in verse 6, God addresses the fact that his sacredness was despised. His sacredness was despised. Look at verse 6. A son honoreth his father, a servant or slave his master. Now that's human relationships. A son should honor his father. A son should recognize his father. A servant is to recognize his master. If then I be a father, and you can imagine God saying this with a broken heart, where is my honor? If I am your heavenly father, if I'm the father of all and over all, as Paul said in Ephesians 3, if I'm the father of lights in whom there's no variableness, neither shadow of turning, if I be father, where is my honor? He's not done yet. He said then, now if I be master, where's my fear? Saith the Lord of hosts unto you, O priest that despise his name. The very name of the Lord was trodden underfoot. They were despising the grace of God. They were making light of God's name. Even there were Jews, and we studied this in our series through the book of Isaiah, there were Jews who were taking the name of God in vain profusely and frequently. God's name was despised. There was no fear of God. There was no honor of the Lord. God tells us in Psalms 8.1, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name throughout all the earth. Psalms 113, verse 3, from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, the Lord's name is to be praised. I wonder this morning, as you began this day and you rolled out of bed, did you take a moment to exalt the name of the Lord at the rising of the sun? Did you take a moment to acknowledge him as El Elyon, the Most High God? Did you acknowledge him this morning as El Shaddai, the Almighty God? Did you acknowledge him this morning as El, as, as El, Shalom, as, uh, uh, El Olam, the Everlasting God? Did you recognize him as Jehovah uh, 
Jehovah uh, Rohi, the Lord our shepherd, as Jehovah Rapha, as the Lord who heals? Did you acknowledge him as the Lord who provides? Did you acknowledge him this morning as the king who is eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God? Did you acknowledge him this morning as the God who loves you? The Bible says from the rising of the sun to the very down, going down the same, the Lord's name is to be praised. Paul in writing to the believers there, or excuse me, Peter and John is speaking to the believers there in Acts chapter 4 verse 12 and speaking about the importance and the greatness of the name of the Lord, they said this, neither is there salvation in any other, for there's none other name given among men under heaven whereby we must be saved. The Lord's name is to be praised. Wherefore God has also highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. God's name is to be lifted up. But as we read verse 6, his sacredness was despised. He was disrespected. He was despised by his very same people. But we see something else. Notice verses 7 and 8. God not only addresses the fact they were despising his name, but he addresses their sacrifices. He addresses what they were bringing to the altar before God. And God addresses that their sacrifices were defective. Notice verse 7. You offer polluted bread upon my altar. The likelihood as we read about that is probably the meal offerings he's speaking about there. And there they were, they were mixing leaven with unleavened. They were supposed to produce unleavened bread. They were mixing leaven with it. Wherever you read about leaven in the Bible, it's a picture of sin. They were despising it. On top of that, this is what the Bible says. You offer polluted bread upon my altar, and you say, wherein have we polluted thee? They were saying, what do you mean, God, that we're polluting you? What do you mean, Lord, that we're bringing a polluted offering before you? And the Lord told them this. He says, in that you say, the table of the Lord is contentable. They got to the place, and we find this twice in this chapter. They were saying that serving God and doing the, the meal offering was, was contentable. They got to despising it. They got tired of it. You know, let's just be honest. Sometimes in your human nature, you just feel like, I don't feel like going to church today. I don't feel like giving an offering today. I don't feel like I need to give. I don't feel like I need to participate. Let somebody else do it. Let the younger people do it. Let somebody else who came back from Bible college do it. Let the staff do it. Let the preacher do it. Let somebody else do it. And they get the place. I don't feel like I want to get involved anymore. They say that the table of the Lord, the service of God, this is contemptible. They don't let me do what I want to do. They don't let me run the church the way I want to run the church. The table of the Lord is Condentable. And God says, your sacrifices are defective. Look at verse 8. If you offer the blind for sacrifice, he says, is it not evil? And if you offer the lame and sick, is it not evil? Offer it now to thy governor. Will he be pleased with thee or accept thy person? Saith the Lord of hosts. And here God is talking about their sacrifices. They knew that they were to bring a lamb of the first year. A male lamb. A lamb of the first year. A lamb that was unblemished. A lamb that was not injured. A lamb that was not defective. A lamb that, had no, that was not hurt. A lamb that was not diseased a lamb that was not crippled. They were to give the best of their flock before God. But instead of giving their best, they were giving their inferior or their worst. It's like this. It's like somebody calling up the church and saying, hey, I've got an old broken down TV set. Can I donate it? Or someone's saying this. I've got a... I've got a car that's got 300,000 miles on it. It's got, it's got probably got a few more thousand miles. Would the church like to have it? Now, thank God that you're thinking about the church, and thank God that you're, you're, you're offering that. But what God is saying is, why don't you give your best? Maybe if you're going to go out and shop for a new car and buy a brand new car, the latest series of something, why don't you apply that same principle and give your best? But instead, he's saying the people of God are coming. Instead of giving God their best, they're giving God their inferior. They're giving God their least. They're giving God their worst. And basically, they're tipping God if they felt like it, but they, but they, they weren't giving God their best here. And so God says this. He said in verse 8, is this not evil? He said, how can you say you're giving your best to God? Is it not evil? How can you say you're doing that before the Lord? And he says, listen, would you give that to the governor? Would you give that to the leader of the land? Would you give such a thing to him? He says, of course you would not. He said, you think he'll accept you or be pleased with that? And God has asked these questions with a broken heart to his people saying, don't you recognize that for many years, this is how you bring your offerings to me? This is how you represent your sacrifices? They're sacrifices were defective. Heritage Baptist Church is blessed for all these 22 years of a giving people, a giving congregation. I remind you this morning, we're most like God when we give like God. And when we're not giving, and we're not serving, and we're not doing our best, we're giving God worse. We're giving God that which he describes as being evil. When you come to the Lord, is it when you remember? 
Do you even have the discipline to think on the first day of the week, as the Lord has prospered you, to lay aside? Do you honor the Lord with your substance, the first fruits of all your increase? Do you recognize that God is the giver of all things, that everything you have, God has given you, is perfect and it's good because it's from God? Amen? Do you recognize that? Or is it just we're going with life, doing our thing, giving whatever we feel like giving before the Lord? Their sacrifices were defective. But God's not finished yet. Notice he speaks to them. He has an issue with, their, with them as servants. Look at verse 10. It's an issue with them as, their, as servants. And he calls out and says in verse 10 that as servants they are displeasing. Who is there even among you that would shut the doors for naught? Neither do you kindle fire my altar for naught. Now remember, he's speaking to the priests. He's speaking about those who are in a leadership capacity. Visibly out there to influence others. Everything rises and falls on leadership. What you say, what you do, what you don't say, and what you don't do influences impacts other lives. And here are these priests who in their daily service were to open and shut the doors. God said he'd take care of them, and he did take care of them. And if you're contemplating going to service and to serving God in the ministry, you're not going in for the money. And you're not going in to receive the praise of men. And you're not going in to become a celebrity status like a Joel Austin. Joel Austin's a fake. Joel Austin's a false prophet. And say the same with all the prosperity theology preachers like them. That is not the ministry. That is the delusional idea of the ministry. The ministry you go in because you have a calling of God. And the ministry you go in because God says, I want to use you. And to have the attitude like Paul, who said, I thank Christ Jesus my Lord, who has enabled me, having counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. And understanding that to serve God is a privilege. And to worship the Lord in this life is a privilege. Because, you know, if you're saved, you're going to spend all of eternity worshiping the Lord. And so, here are these priests who were to be opening, shutting the doors. God said he'd already take care of them, and he was taking care of them. They were to keep the fire lit on the altar morning and evening. Read about that in Exodus. And these priests, their attitude was, why should I do it? What are you going to pay me? Uh, what do I get out of it? I'll do it if I feel like it. How are you going to reward me? Uh, do I get a bonus? Uh, they're doing it for remuneration. They're doing it for recognition. And so the question God was asking with a broken heart, who is there even among you? I mean, can you imagine speaking to all the hundreds of priests that were serving the altar of God. Who is there even among you that would just shut the doors for nothing? Neither do you kindle fire on my altar. And God says about their, their uh, servants, he said, I have no pleasure in you, saith the Lord of hosts, neither will I accept an offering your hands. God was saying with a broken heart, I'm not very pleased with what you're doing. Whew, that's rough. Imagine the years, the months, and if you want to get a good profile of that, go back to Nehemiah chapter 13 and read in Nehemiah chapter 13 how Nehemiah had to confront those priests and those leaders of what they're doing. May I remind you this morning, anybody who serves God in this church, anybody who serves God in this church, especially if you teach, you're a sponsor, you're an extension of my ministry, and I'm an extension of God's ministry. And remind you this morning, your influence will make or break the people that you're teaching to. People do what people see. As a leader, the person of any influence, you give your best to God. You well represent the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? But notice something else. Look at verses 11 to 14. God spoke about the fact that they were despising his name, he had issues with their sacrifices. He called them out as servants. But he calls out their service as a whole. In verse 11, he speaks about a future point of time. We studied this out in our series through Isaiah. During the millennium, the 1,000-year reign of Christ, the Gentile nations, those sheep nations, they'll converge and there'll be these Ambassadors that will go out from Israel to encourage people to come to Jerusalem. 
and to come and worship the Lord. And God is telling them, you know, in the future, these non, non-Jews, these Gentile nations, they will come, and from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, they will bless my name. They'll, raise, they'll honor my name. They'll praise my name. He's saying, you know, there's a time even the Gentiles will come and honor the name of the Lord. And he speaks about, notice verse 11, he speaks about the fact, in every place incense shall be offered to my name. Not just in the temple. He said, in every place incense shall be offered. And he calls it a pure offering. That's just a great thought right there. A pure offering will be given to the Lord. And he's saying in the midst of all that, he says, now, my name will be great among the heathen, say the Lord of hosts. It's almost like God's saying, okay, I have a day coming. I know what's going to happen. And a day will come, there will be a people that will exalt my name. But you, my people right now, who I've brought back out of captivity, who I've used Gentile nations to put you where you're at, and I've protected you, and I've enabled you to rebuild the temple, and I've enabled you to rebuild the walls and establish the gates, and I've reestablished your testimony. My name is not great in my own city. My name is not great in my own home. I've got people on the outside that one day will come, will honor my name. But what about my people? And so God now starts with that. And notice in verses 12 to 14, some things God says he has to denounce. For instance, verse 12, he says, but you have profaned it, the name of the Lord. You have profaned it in that you say. Now this is what they were saying in their heart and with their mouth. They were just saying that the service of God was contemptible. They were tired of serving God. They said, I'll give God what I can at my best. You know, one of the recurring statements you hear all the time from people this. They say, I'll serve God when I have more time. I'll serve God when I retire. I'll serve God after I finish my job. Let me tell you how that all works out. You won't serve God. And when you retire, you'll find somebody else, something else to replace him. You'll be busy with something else. You still won't have time. And you say, well, I'll serve God when I have time. Let me tell you this morning, we need to serve God while we've got good health and while we've got life because tomorrow may come, you may not have an opportunity to serve God. Amen. People get tired of serving God. People complain about serving God. People complain about who they serve with. And God says here, just, I'm going to tell you what it is. He says, you said the table of the Lord is polluted, and the fruit thereof, even his meat is contemptible. We're tired of the routine. We're tired of the service. We're tired of these same things. He said, it's contemptible. You know, people get that way. But he's not finished yet. He goes to verse 13. He says, you also said, behold, what a weariness it is. You've snuffed at it. You've gone... Here we go again. We're having another evangelistic endeavor. We're trying to reach more souls. We're trying to raise another offering for missions. We're trying to encourage more people to serve God. We're having another work day. Whatever it may be, you, oh, here we go again. They've snuffed us. I don't want to do anymore. I'm tired of this. And the Lord said this. You brought that which was torn and the lame and the sick. Thus you brought an offering. Can you imagine this? Imagine this with me for this moment. The priests are lining up, representing the people. And here are the sheep they're bringing. They're crippled. They're diseased. They're disabled. They're blind. They've been injured because they've been attacked by a predatorial type animal like a wolf or bear. They're bleeding. Some can't even walk on their fours. They're placing at the altar. It doesn't bother them. They become very indifferent towards it. And they're saying, here, God, this is what we're going to give you. And God says about this, notice verse 13. God says, do you think I should even accept this from your hand, saith the Lord? Then in verse 14, the Lord says this as he denounces all that. Cursed be the deceiver which has in his flock a male and voweth and sacrifices unto the Lord a corrupt thing. God says it's a curse. You have your best right here. You have that male. And yet you don't bring your best before God. Brother and sister in Christ, I'm very thankful here at his Baptist church. I'm very thankful. I'm very thankful for God's people who've stayed faithful I mean, just recently, we just paid off some major debt off this, this, this building right here. We're trying to pay down the rest of the other building. We're trying to raise our largest offering ever for Faith Promise Missions in three weeks, three and a half weeks. We're planning some expansion we need to do for the church.
And sometimes if you've been here one year or five years or 10 years, 20 years or even 22 years, if we don't catch our hearts, we can become like these Jews and we say, what a weariness is it? We have our best, but we don't give God our best. We give God our least. In some cases, some people give more as a tip when they buy food at a restaurant than they do in giving their tithe and their offering before God. God, help our soul. Now, I'm saying this morning, God had to make a righteous indictment. And so as we look at that, you say, well, what does, is there any hope for us? Yes, there is hope. Because as we see, we go back and see that God has a royal identity. And he makes a righteous indictment. I want you to notice two verses and the theme of this book. Because it brings us back to one thing. God is not finished with us. And God has not given us. How many are thankful today God is merciful and he doesn't give up on us? Amen? I'm thankful for that. And I want you to notice as we close, we're going to wrap it all together this morning. The theme of Malachi 1 through 4. Chapters 1 through 4 is found in verses 1 and 2. Would you notice this? The burden of the word of the Lord by Malachi. I have loved you, saith the Lord. Now that's the theme. God said, I have loved you. How many thankful God loves you this morning? Amen? Man, you may have looked in the mirror, didn't like what you saw, but God still loved you. Amen? You may have looked at your dog and your dog may have barked at you, but God still loves you. Amen? I mean, how many are glad this morning that he loves you with an everlasting love? It's an inseparable love. It's an unconquerable love. It's an everlasting love. He says, I've loved thee with an everlasting love. In John 13, 1, God says this about as Jesus got there to that, that last supper there and the disciples assembled, it tells us right there in verse 1 that Jesus loved them to the very end. You read out John chapter 13. It was really the last and final message God gave gave to Judas Iscariot. The whole intent of that was to get Judas Iscariot saved. Judas rejected the love of Jesus Christ there and speaking to him as he just went through the as he went through the, the, the uh, as, he, as he washed the feet of the, of the disciples there and had a towel and a basin and so forth there. But Judas still rejected him. The Bible says Judas rejected the Lord and Satan entered into him. But Jesus loved him to the very end. I remind you this morning, we will sin and we will make our mistakes and there are some times when we disappoint God but that doesn't change God's love for us. God still loves you and I the same. He said, I've loved thee with an everlasting love. And so as we look at this, we notice in spite of this righteous indictment, we see a redeeming invitation from our Lord. God is giving us another opportunity, and God wants us to come back. And God says, I know that perhaps you've displaced me off the throne, but I want you to know you have an opportunity to, to reestablish me on the throne. I want you to know I make an invitation to you. It's a redeeming invitation. So we go down to verse 9, and notice in verse 9 he says this, and now I pray you, beseech God that he would be gracious unto us. God says, now here's what you need to do. You need to come to me. You need to approach me and beg me and beseech me, plead with me and say, God, be gracious to us. Oh, listen this morning. Today is God's people and perhaps as God through his word has spoken to us and our heart has been pricked here and there and maybe God has just kind of thrust the sword of his word in a little bit and convicting us about perhaps that we have not been loyal to Christ and honoring to the Lord and he's not really the king of our hearts. We can get that fixed today. We can get him back on the throne of our hearts because there's a throne he needs to be on, and that's the throne of your heart. Whatever's been on your heart other than Jesus Christ, we can get Jesus back on the throne. But we need to come with a repentant heart and say, Oh, Lord, God, I want you to be king. Going back to 2 Samuel, you remember the story there? Absalom, the son of David, had rebelled against David, and he led it. He stood in the king's gate, and he led a large fallen people that became disloyal to David. And David recognized that. And David had to flee the kingdom. But the day came when all of Absalom's delusional dreams came shattering to earth, and they crashed. And Absalom died a very terrible death. And as Absalom hung there, and he was killed by Joab, jo David was brokenhearted because he loved his son. He knew his son messed up, but he loved his son very much. And David was at the place where he just felt, uh, he just felt like he just felt paralyzed. He didn't feel like, he just didn't have any desire of coming back to the kingdom and serving. He knew he was king. He knew he had to serve his king, but just that desire was missing. And Joab came to him. He said, king, if you don't get back on the throne, the people are going to scatter. They need to know that you still love them. And they need to know that you're still going to be their leader. And they need to know that you're going to assume your responsibility. And so Joab got the people together and he got word out to all the leadership. And he made this question. He said, why speak you not a word of bringing back the king? Why speak you not a word of bringing back the king? And brother and sister in Christ, the 
question God asks us today. Why don't you speak a word? Why don't you take a motion forward? Why don't you take a step forward and recognize today, why speak ye not a word of bringing back the king? Let's get Jesus back on the throne. Let's get Jesus back on the throne of our heart. Let's get Jesus back on the throne of our pocketbook. Let's get Jesus back on the throne of our service. Let's get Jesus back on the throne where he rightly belongs so that we can come to that throne of grace to find that mercy and grace to find help in time of need. Let's get Jesus back on the throne this morning. How do you do that? Number one, we need to repent. He said in verse 9, Was there even among you? Excuse me, verse 9. And I pray you, beseech God to be gracious unto us. We need to repent. And you tell the Lord, listen, God, I've, Lord, my priorities all messed up. Here's my heart. You can sit on it. Solomon, as a king, knew the importance of the heart. He says, keep thy heart with all diligence. For out of it proceedeth the issues of life. And I think as Solomon wrote that, he thought about the throne of our heart. You got to work at it through prayer and Bible reading and church attendance and serving God and making sure Christ is always on the throne. There's a second group of people this morning. You may be someone today watching by live stream or here in person. You're not part of God's family, you've never been born again and saved. I recently had someone come in to see me. It's one of those situations where they just want to be heard. Went back to their family history, told me a lot more than I needed to hear, a lot more than I wanted to hear. About 15 minutes of that, I shifted the conversation back. I said, hey, tell me about your faith. Are you saved? Can you give me a testimony? I was very polite. They talked for 20, 25 minutes. One couldn't tell me they were saved. Now, you may have been to church, and you may have, been, you may have gone through the motions of praying a prayer, and you may be good friends with the youth pastor. You may be good friends with Brother Daniel in our children's ministry. And you might, you might be someone who's been here even from day one in the start of this church. And you may be someone who's part of a prayer group, who's been gone through discipleship, but you've never had repentance towards God and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. If you've never called upon Jesus Christ as your, uh, to be your Savior, you might want to examine yourself whether you're in the faith this morning. You might want to determine and acknowledge, are you really saved? Are you really born again? Have you come under, have you been born again by, into the kingdom of God? Have you really gotten saved? I'm not talking, did you join a church? And I'm not talking about if you came out of a Protestant background. And I'm not saying that now you've gone from Protestant to becoming Baptist because Baptists are not Protestants. I'm not talking about that. I'm saying this morning, do you understand this morning? It is not about your religion. It's not about who you know. It's not about what church it is. It's about your relationship with God. Do you know for certain this morning if you die today that you're going to spend all of eternity in heaven because that's the most important question in life you've got to deal with today if you're not saved before Jesus is your king he needs to be your savior you're a sinner and sin is bad sin sends every sinner to hell God doesn't want you to go to hell God loves you amen why don't you go to heaven? How many glad about that this morning? Amen. And so someone had to suffer for your sins. And that was Jesus. Jesus shed his blood. He died a violent and a cruel death on the cross for every sinner. The Bible says he became the propitiation for our sins. And not for our sins only, but for the sins of all. All that means is this. He satisfied all of God's just demands for sins through his death on the cross. For us. He's the only one who could satisfy God's demands for sins by his death on the cross. Your part, he's done everything. Your part is come to God with a heart of repentance and by faith say, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who died for me and rose again from the dead. You can receive him today and be saved. Many, many years ago, the king sat in his palace in England 
He had a royal gate that you had to go through. The gate was guarded by sentries. Those sentries kept that gate closed. They, gate, they basically were the gatekeepers to open and close it. A boy wanted to come and have access to the king. It's a well-dressed boy. He made his way to the gate, but the two sentries blocked it. And they said, son, what do you want? He said, well, I want to see the king. And they said, you can't see the king. He tried every way he could. He tried every way he could to get to them. They said, son, you cannot see the king. The boy was dejected. He was discouraged. Stuck his hands in his pockets. His head fell down. He felt very discouraged. He couldn't see the king. He barely made his way 10, 15 feet. And a very well-dressed, distinguished man with a sword at his side came walking up. This very well-dressed, distinguished man said, Son, what is wrong with you? Why is your head down? Why are your hands in your pocket? And the boy with a tear coming down his eyes said, Sir, I wanted to go to the gate. And I wanted to see the king. But he said, These men, these sentries, these soldiers said, I can't see the king. The, boy, the man turned to the boy, very distinguished gentleman. He said, Son, give me your hand. He took the boy by the hand. The boy put his hand in that big man's hand. The man walked up to the gate. As he did so, the sentries recognized this man of dignity. They moved aside. They opened the gate. They revered him. They bowed to this man. They opened the gate. The man walked through the gate without any hindrance, without anybody bothering, without anybody checking his ID. He walked through the gate, went through another set of doors, walked inside the palace, went up to the place where the king was sitting on his throne. Everyone around saw this man as he's holding the little boy's hand. They accepted him and acknowledged him. They let him come all the way up. And he brought this little boy all the way to the throne and introduced him to the king. That man was the prince of Wales. That man was the king's son. That boy didn't recognize it, but at that moment he recognized he couldn't get there on his own. He had to go there through the son. And I remind you this morning, your way to the king is through the son. And that son is the son of God, Jesus Christ. And when you put your little hand and your little insignificance and your little weakness into the mighty hand of our Savior, who said, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. When you put your little insignificant, weak hand in my hand into the hand of our mighty Savior. He brings you and I before our God. He brings you before the King. And he says this, and to as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Don't you want to be and have your hand in the hand of the Son? He brings you to the King. He offers that to you this morning, that you can be saved, that eternal life can be yours. Your sins can be forgiven, and you can become a son of God. Christian friend, don't you think this morning in the very presence of God, because he knows, is he king of your heart and king of your life? Does he sit exclusively on the throne? The Bible says he's individually exclusive. He's the only king. Is there somebody else there instead of Jesus? Would you let him be king of kings and Lord of lords this morning? I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that. If you're not saved, I'm going to give you an invitation right where you're at it, on live stream or seated in here. You can call on Jesus Christ to be your Savior. Let's stand if you would, please. Thank you for being so attentive with every head bowed and every eye closed. Father, this morning...